Hi everyone. In this video, I want to give you an introduction to the concept of gravitational potential energy, which is very closely related to the work done by gravity, but is a little bit different conceptually. So to motivate this, I want to do an example problem first. Um, and as a reminder, we have this quantity called work and it's equal to the work done by a force is the magnitude of the force times the magnitude of the displacement times the cosine uh, of the angle between the force and the displacement. So we have that as a definition for work and we're gonna investigate um, the work done by gravity near Earth's surface. So that means that the force that we're gonna look at is the force of gravity, which is equal to mass times uh, the gravitational acceleration constant. And we'll take G to be equal to 10 meters per second per second for the purposes of this video. Um, also importantly, the force of gravity points towards Earth. So this force point is pointing towards Earth, which is relevant. Okay, so let's take a situation. So I've got this, um, my example problem, I've got you know, the ground here, and I have a box of undesirable blueberries. And um, someone wants to move them. Where they're going to move them is they're going to take that box, pick it up, and move it over and up. So they're going to move it to this position over here in a straight line uh, like this. So they're moving it in a straight line like this from there to there. So this is the box of undesirable uh, blueberries at some later time. Um, and so the displacement is this. So here's the displacement, I'll write that in red, um, is along this red arrow here. So the box is just moving from its starting position to some final position along a path that looks like this. It's move, being moved in a straight line that, that way. And we'll say that we'll choose a coordinate system such that it starts at 0, 0 and ends at 5, 2. So starts at 0, 0, ends up uh, 5 meters in the x-coordinate and 2 meters in the y-coordinate. Let's say that. And uh, let's also establish a few other things. So the mass of bub is two kilograms, let's say. And we want to know how much work is done by gravity in this process. Note that there might be other forces acting here. In fact, there are almost certainly will be. Um, but we're only going to consider the work done by gravity. So we're just we're not calculating the network here. We're just calculating the work done by gravity. Okay, so to calculate that, we want to find W sub G. I'll say that's the work done by gravity. That's equal to the force of gravity, the magnitude of it, times the displacement covered by bub, times cosine of the angle between the displacement and the force of gravity. So let's take all of these pieces. So let's do the angle first. So if I, there's an angle here between the displacement and the x-axis, I'm going to call that something. That's an alpha, by the way, it kind of looks like a fish, but I'm going to call it alpha. And it's important to recognize that this angle here that I just called alpha is not the same as the angle between gravity and the displacement. Gravity goes straight down this way, and the displacement goes out in this direction. So if we think about it, the angle we really want is this one, which is not the same thing as the angle between the displacement and the x-axis. It's really the angle between the displacement and the negative y-axis, because that's the direction that gravity points. So to figure out the angle we want, here's gravity. This makes a 90 degree angle. So if we take 90 degrees plus the angle in here, that's the angle we want. Okay, so 90 plus whatever this angle is, is going to be our theta. So what's theta? Well, 
we can use some of our triangle knowledge uh, to figure out what alpha is. So I've got a triangle. The side length here is five. The side length here is two. Tangent of the angle in there, tangent of alpha, is equal to the opposite side to the angle over the adjacent side to the angle. So if I have this ratio of side lengths, that's equal to the tangent of that angle. If I do the inverse tangent then of two fifths, I should get what that angle is. And I calculate that out, that's equal to about 21.8 degrees. Therefore, our theta is equal to 90 plus 21.8 degrees, um, 100 and 11.8 degrees. Okay, so that's the angle between the force of gravity here and the displacement. Okay, so how big is the displacement? The displacement will be the length of the hypotenuse of this little triangle right here. So I can use Pythagorean theorem. So five squared plus two squared will be equal to my displacement squared. I'll call that displacement delta x. So delta x will be the square root of five squared plus two squared. And that value is about 5.39 meters. So let me plug this all in. So now I want the force of gravity to, it's a two kilogram box. We said that uh, gravitational acceleration is 10 for the purposes of this video. So force of gravity is two uh, kilograms times 10 meter per second squared times the displacement is 5.39 times the cosine of 111.8 degrees. If you plug all of that in, you get minus 40 joules. Ends up being a nice clean number. Where did the minus sign come from? The minus sign comes from the cosine of uh, 111.8 degrees. If you get cosine between 90 and 180, it's gonna be negative, which makes sense because uh, conceptually what the minus sign means is that the force is pulling against uh, the direction you're going. Our displacement does move up. So to some extent, gravity is kind of pulling against that. So we would expect the work to be negative. Okay, so that all checks out. Um, and our result is minus 40 joules. Okay, I wanna do the same problem again, but in a different way with a different path. So let's say I take the same thing. So I take my bub and I'm going to circle all of this, and copy paste it and do the same problem again, but a li little bit differently. So let me, let me scroll down. So, okay, so instead of moving bub in a straight line, I'm gonna erase this part. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move bub along a path that goes perfectly horizontally at first, this way, and then goes perfectly vert vertically this way, up that way. So instead of going in a straight line, like we did in the first case, along a displacement like this, we kind of have two separate displacements. We go horizontally five meters, and then we go vertically two meters. So we end up in the same place, but the way we got there was a little bit different. So um, this is a different path. So consider another path. And we want to ask the same question. Um, how much work is done by gravity on this path? How much work is done by gravity? And you might think a little bit about that. Um, does it matter if we, if we move the box in the same way uh, or in a different way? Or uh, does it not matter? Um, so let's investigate. So this time we kind of have two paths and we could think, we could think about splitting the work done um, up into the work done along the first path, this horizontal path, plus the work done along this vertical path. So the total work done, I could say, the total work done by gravity will be equal to what I'll call W1 plus W2. And what I mean by W1 
is that's the work done along the horizontal part. And W2 means the work done along the vertical part. And we're going to split the problem into these two parts and see what happens. So the first part, if I calculate the work from 0, 0 to 5, 0, well, the displacement there is purely horizontal. So my displacement vector goes to the right. My force vector goes down vertically. So the angle between those two things is 90. So let's plug in some stuff. So here, the work done is the force of gravity times the displacement times the cosine of the angle between the force and the displacement. So gravity is 2 times 10, 2 kilograms times 10 meters per second squared, times the displacement is 5 meters, times the cosine of 90, because it's a 90 degree angle between the displacement and the force. The cosine of 90 is 0, so all of this ends up being 0. There's no work done along this horizontal part of the path. And the way to think about that is that we're moving horizontally, but gravity is a vertical force. And therefore, no work is done by gravity when that's the case. If you've got a force perpendicular to your path, it does no work. So that checks out. Let's take a look at the second part of the path. So what I called uh, W2, the work done going from 5,0 up to 5,2. So let's take a look at that. In this case, we're moving vertically upward, so the displacement vector goes up while gravity points down. Therefore, the angle between displacement and gravity is 180 degrees. So we're going to have cosine of 100 degree, 180 degrees in our answer. So let's go through the whole thing. So we're going to have force of gravity times the displacement times cosine of the angle between force and displacement. In that case, the force of gravity is 2 times 10, so 2 kilograms times 10 meters per second squared, times the displacement is 2, because we're going up uh, from 5, 0 to 5, 2, and then times the cosine of 180 degrees, because the displacement is opposite of the force of gravity, so they're 180 degrees apart. If I do all of that, cosine 180 is minus 1, and 2 times 10 is 20, times 2 again is 40, times minus 1. The work done along this path is minus 40 joules. And I'll remind you at this point that that's what we got before. So we got, when we did the path that just went from the initial position along a straight line to the final position, we got 40 joules. And in this case, when we moved horizontally first and then vertically upwards, we end up getting that there's no work done along the first part, the horizontal part, and minus 40 joules along the second part. The total work of gravity, therefore, is the sum of these two works, 0 minus 40 joules equals minus 40 joules. So the work done is the same in both cases, no matter what path you take. And this is, this is one thing I, I kind of want to emphasize. The work done by gravity does not depend on the path you take. Between two points. Or between a start and ending point. And this is, maybe it's intuitive, but it's really worth emphasizing. And I'll put a special, maybe I'll put a special star next to that. Um, and another way to interpret this is that really, if we, if we break it down into these two parts, the horizontal part and the vertical part, the horizontal part of the motion really doesn't do anything. We don't, gravity doesn't do anything along that part. Gravity's only doing work on the vertical part. And that's true whether or not the path is purely vertical or not. Even in the case where we have a motion that's not purely vertical, only the vertical part of the motion really counted. We end up with the same result if we're doing this path, uh, this kind of uh, angled path, versus going straight up. 
So it really only matters what initial height you had and what final height you had. Okay, so let me reconceptualize this uh, in a slightly different way. So we can generalize from these results a little bit. We can say that the work done by gravity, just by gravity, not counting any other forces, just by gravity, is equal to minus the mass times g, the acceleration constant, times delta y, where uh, delta y represents the difference between the final and initial uh, positions, the vertical displacement. So let's talk about an example. So let's say I've got a baseball here, or I don't know, a lacrosse, I don't know, some sort of, some sort of ball. And it's, uh, let's say it's half of a kilogram. And I move that ball along some path and it's gonna be an arbitrary path like this. So I start it, I start it here, I end it here, I move it along some weird path like this. And all that matters is the height it started with and the height it ended with for calculating the work done by gravity. So if I said this initial position is in some coordinate system is 410 and the final position in that same coordinate system is 813 so that at the beginning I have four meters in x from the origin and 10 meters um, in y from the origin at the end I've got eight uh, meters in x from the origin and 13 meters in y from the origin, then the work done by gravity will be equal to minus the mass times g times delta y. So that's equal to minus 0.5 times 10 times delta y. The delta y is 13, the final, minus 10, the initial. So a change in three in the y position. So that's equal to um, minus 0.5 times 10 times 3, which is equal to minus 15 joules of work. Okay. It did not matter that we did this whole crazy path. All that matters is the initial and final y positions. The initial and final x positions don't count at all either. Um, because all that matters is really how your uh, y position is changing, how your vertical position is changing when, when gravity is the force. That only works because gravity is a force that points vertically downward. Other forces will not have the same kind of form. Um, it's specific to gravity near Earth's surface. And so we can kind of think about this a little bit differently. Um, we can define something called gravitational potential energy. And so one thing that we could uh, think about here is we've talked about how work, it represents a transfer of energy from one type to another. So when I have a baseball here that's starting here and going there, you know, it takes work, it takes someone else doing work or some other force doing work to lift the ball up against gravity. And what's happening is we're trading that energy, whatever energy has to go into this ball for uh, gravitational potential energy to lift it. So that if we were to drop the ball from up here, it would gain some speed by the time it got back to its original spot. And so when we lift the ball, when we lift a ball, we can say we're giving that ball gravitational potential energy. And so we can reconceptualize, um, we can reconceptualize the work done by gravity, the negative work done by gravity as we lift things, 
as a positive change in the gravitational potential energy. in gravitational potential energy. And I'll write that as PE to stand for potential energy. So that means that when I lift something, when I lift some this baseball against gravity along some paths, as long as it's going higher, negative work is being done by gravity, but that should correspond with a positive change in potential energy. We've got more gravitational potential energy the higher this baseball gets. And so, all the change in potential energy is, sub G to mean uh, for gravity, is just negative the work done by gravity. So if the work done by gravity is always minus mass times G times the change in uh, vertical position, the change in potential energy will just be opposite that and will be positive mass times gravity, uh, gravitational acceleration constant times the change in the Y position. And this represents the potential energy that we gain when we lift something. So we, we, we trade some other form of energy to lift this baseball a little bit. On the other hand, if we were going to drop something so that delta y uh, was negative, like we started at a higher position and something fell to a lower position so that the final position was lower than the initial position, that would be a negative change in potential energy. We'd be losing potential energy and getting some other form of energy out. So that's the way to think about that. So I wanna do one last example of how we actually use this. So one final example here. So let's take, I guess, another baseball. So how do we use this? Um, so let's think about first in general, we know that the work done by the net force is equal to the change in kinetic energy. That's the work energy theorem. As a reminder, I'll just write that. This is the work energy theorem. So the work done by all of the forces on an object is equal to the change in kinetic energy for that object we kind of have a different way of thinking about the work done by gravity now. That's what this part represents at the top. And so we can think about the work, all of the total work being equal to really the addition of the work done by gravity plus the work done by other forces. So we could have other forces doing work, um, but we have a special way of treating the work done by gravity now. We kind of know how to represent that in this really nice way. So let's pull out the work done by gravity um, so we can treat it separately because we know how to deal with that. Um, this is still equal to the, the change in kinetic energy because we still have kept track of all of the work being done by forces. Um, but the work done by gravity is now negative the change in the potential energy of gravity because that's how we defined the change in potential energy. And all I've done there is just use this part of the definition here to rewrite um, the work done by gravity as negative the change of potential energy, just reconceptualizing what it means for gravity to do work. And okay, so the punchline kind of is to say that the work done by all other forces will be equal to the change in kinetic energy plus the change in the gravitational potential energy. So we're kind of taking this work equation and uh, changing it so that we can think of what gravity is doing as modifying the energy rather than doing work. So we can think about gravity now having energy, you can gain or lose gravitational energy rather than just thinking about gravity as another force that's, that's doing work over here. And that's kind of a, a nice way to conceptualize what's happening when the force of gravity is acting. Um, and this is kind of a cool equation. One of the things it says is that if there's no other forces acting, then if there's no other forces acting, 
then this side of the equation is nothing. There's no other forces acting, or if there's no other forces doing work, same thing. The work done by other forces would be zero. And then zero would be equal to the change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy. And that says, as potential energy changes, the kinetic energy changes oppositely. So if, I, if my potential energy goes up for gravity, like if I lift something up, then my kinetic energy goes down. And similarly, if I let something fall, so the potential energy and gravity goes down, then my kinetic energy goes up. Um, and it's kind of a nice uh, way to think about what's happening in the exchange between kinetic and potential energy. Okay, so last example here of how we actually use this. Let's say I've got, um, I'm throwing a baseball. So here, here I am. I've got a baseball hat on because I'm throwing a baseball. So I've got this baseball here and I throw it up. It's on some trajectory like this. And it comes down to some, some height above my, my hand. So let's say I throw it, I'm gonna give it some uh, quantities here. So I throw it with some initial velocity, which is 10 meters per second. And maybe I throw it a certain angle above horizontal. And then um, I want to know how fast is it going right here? So how fast, I should maybe mark this as example. How fast is the baseball going here? One more thing I should say is that the ball is three meters above where I released it. Okay. So let's try to apply um, our new way of thinking about gravity to this problem. So the first question to ask is, what forces do work in this situation? Well, let's ignore air resistance and all sort of frictional forces. So after I release the ball with this initial speed, the only force that does work is gravity. There's no other forces acting on the ball. So if there's no other forces doing work on the ball, we can use this equation. So the, the change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy from gravity will be zero. So we can use that. Um, one way to think about that equation is it says that the change in kinetic energy, which is some final kinetic energy minus some initial kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy, which is some final potential energy minus some initial potential energy is equal to zero. And if I move the initial parts over to this side um, so that I add initial kinetic energy and initial potential energy to both sides, then I get this interesting equation that says the initial kinetic energy plus the initial potential energy equals the final kinetic energy plus the final, oops, plus the final potential energy. So if you add up the initial uh, kinetic energy and potential energy, that's the same as the final potential energy and kinetic energy. This is one way of stating conservation of energy. So if you add up all of the energies in your problem at some time, that will always be the same number no matter when you look. So if we take some initial time, add up all of the energies, that will always be equal to the energies at some later time. So let's use that here. Initially, um, we have some uh, kinetic energy because the initial kinetic energy is one half mass times V initial squared. That's how much kinetic energy I have initially. I can also define what I mean by initial potential energy and final potential energy. I can mean that if the change in potential energy for gravity is equal to this equation right here, I can just let M times G times the vertical height be equal to the potential energy at some given point. So how does that work? Let me establish a coordinate system. I'll say that this point right here, when I release the ball, define that point as y equals zero, 
which I'm free to do. You're always free to choose your coordinate system for uh, in any way that's convenient. So the initial potential energy would be mass times G times the initial height, uh, which is gonna be zero. And at the end, I have some final kinetic energy because we're interested in finding how fast it's going at a, at a different height. Um, and now there is some final potential energy. So M times G times final height. This final height will now be three because relative to this initial point, our ball's three meters higher at the end of this path where we're checking uh, how fast the baseball is going. So if the initial point is Y equals zero, the final point is Y equals three. Okay, let's plug some stuff in. So I have, I wanna, um, also I need some mass for the baseball. The mass of the baseball is equal to 150 grams or 0.15 kilograms. But in fact, I don't need that because the mass cancels out of every term here. And I can start plugging things in. So one half times the mass, which is canceling out. Or I guess, yeah, I'll just cancel it out. So the initial velocity is 10 squared. So that's 100 plus uh, g times zero for the initial height is equal to one half times final velocity squared, which we don't know, plus g times the final height, which is three. The g is 10, so I can write that in two. Let me substitute for g here. g is 10, g is 10. So 50, uh, 50 equals one half V final squared plus 30. If I start solving down here, I'll move the 30 to the other side. So 20 equals one half V final squared. So V final squared, if I multiply by two and take a square root, square root of 40. That's the final velocity. So and that's our that's our answer. I guess I could say square root of 40 meters per second. And that'll be some number, um, which I don't know off the top of my head. But the way we did that was to conceptualize what's happening as a transfer of energy. So as the kinetic energy on on this side goes down, the potential energy on this side goes up. Or if you prefer, as the potential energy increases, the kinetic energy decreases. So our initial kinetic energy is high, our initial potential energy is low. At the end, our final potential energy is high and our final kinetic energy is low. So that's kind of the way that we can use this uh, energy approach. So we've reconceptualized the work done by gravity as a change in potential energy in gravity. When we lift something higher, we've got more potential energy stored in gravity and we have to trade some other form of energy for that. In this case, this example, we're trading kinetic energy in the ball because our final velocity is slower than our initial velocity. Okay, um, we'll keep thinking about this as we go and I hope that was useful and I'll see you soon. Okay, bye.